card drawing to um, participants. So I'll be doing that tomorrow. And then next week I'll be uh, sending it out. Great, wonderful. All right, do you want me, do you want me to take it from here, um, Ashley? Yes. Go okay, yeah. terrific. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Karen Hudson from CHOP, and I'm here with my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Dr. Dorothy Novick and Dr. Kate Donches, who are going to talk to us about an ever so important topic, that of gun safety. And we are just so thrilled that you guys are joining us tonight to hear and learn um, about this. It's in the news every single day. And I just think that we cannot get around having this conversation. And I hope that this will be the first conversation of many more to come. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Dorothy and Dr. Kate, and let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their center and what they're doing at CHOP. And then we'll dive in. Sounds great. Right. Thank um, you. All right, so I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm Kate, everybody. So nice to meet you all. Um, and I'm just gonna share my slides here. So let me know if you can see them. We can, yep. Yes, wow, that was painless. Um, never that, never that <laughs> Never painless. goes quite that well. No, it sure doesn't. Love it when technology works right, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> um, so we, we are just so grateful um, to have kind of tonight to talk through a topic that Dr. Novick and I are just so excited um, and passionate about. Um, we both have had really devastating experiences with children um, and also adults during our training um, with firearm injuries. And, and so we just really are grateful to have the opportunity to talk about this. Um, so I am one of the uh, chief pediatric residents at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I became very passionate about um, kind of gun safety um, and firearm safety when I was a medical student at Temple and saw a lot of kind of family devastation at the hands of firearms um, and have continued that while I'm at CHOP and hope to continue that for kind of the rest of my career in pediatrics. And I'm Dorothy Novick, and I'm a pediatrician at CHOP South Philadelphia Care Network, which is on um, Broad and Morris Streets. I'm also a practice-based scholar with CHOP Center for Violence Prevention. And I think we'll just dive right in. Kate, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. So we're going to talk today about gun safety. And I always kind of just like to say up front that when we talk about gun safety, we're talking really specifically about how to use and store and keep firearms safely or choose not to keep or use them at all. And this is really first and foremost, I mean, it's an incredibly important issue um, as Kate was saying in terms of preventing unintentional injury and death and suicide in the children and teens that we care for. But also it's worth noting too that the majority of guns that are used in crimes are lost and stolen. So firearm safety, it not only keeps guns away from children and teens and households, but it can also keep guns um, from being used with criminal intent as well. And as Kate had mentioned, and this is something that we are both incredibly impassionate about um, given the, um, our personal experiences at work, but it's felt really even more urgent over the last year as gun sales have just gone through the roof since the start of the pandemic. Um, next slide, Kate. So this is a graph of gun sale trends over the last 10 years. And what's really fascinating about it is that it shows these spikes in um, FBI background checks, which we use as a proxy for gun sales. And what it shows is really the way that people tend to purchase firearms when they're, I, Kate, can you go back a sec? I am sorry, I'm trying That's to okay. this thing. There we go. People, thank you, tend to purchase firearms when, for two sort of big reasons, and I'm sure there are more, but the two big drivers are, number one, when people are concerned about the possibility of upcoming um, gun control legislation, which people tend to be very worried about after mass shooting events, like the ones at Sandy Hook, you can see in San Bernardino and Parkland. Mm -hmm. And then the second reason, uh, what the thing that can really drive gun sales is when people are concerned about their own personal safety, as many of us certainly were as the pandemic took hold in March. And then after the killing of George Floyd and the resulting social unrest that we had over the summer. Mm -hmm. So if you go on uh, next slide, Kate. And this is why we've really had these like record setting gun sales over the last year. I should add also that 
a third thing that prompts people to buy guns is when everyone around them is buying guns. So it's kind of becomes this like self-fulfilling cycle where the more guns there are, the more people want to have to keep themselves safe. So you can see this really dramatic rise in gun sales that started last March. And what's really especially concerning about this is that the spike just never really came down like the one that the ones that we saw in the previous slide. So in 2020, we had 23 million firearms sold, which represented a 64% increase from the previous year. And this trend has continued, as you can see, uh, through January 2021. And the data from Pennsylvania is very similar. There's a 40% increase in gun sales in the last three months of 2020. And what I find really particularly chilling and scary about these numbers too is that each of these spikes are gun sales. But of course, these guns don't go anywhere. It's very difficult. You know, guns don't like decompose. They really don't break. People have firearms in their home that belong to like their great, great grandfathers. You know, these guns stay um, on the streets and homes and all the places where our patients live and play. So if we go, um, next slide, please. So we know that there are 4.6 million children. And actually this um, statistic is from before this most recent surge. 4.6 million children who live in homes with a loaded, unlocked gun, that most unintentional childhood firearm deaths occur in homes. And that for teenagers who live um, in, for teenagers who might become suicidal, if they live in a home where there is a loaded, unlocked gun, they're four to 10 times higher risk of actually completing that suicide attempt. Next slide. And so now we have not only this rise in gun sales, which we know from um, previous surges in gun sales is associated with an increase in um, childhood um, death and injury. We also have the factors of the pandemic itself. And so the concern is that all of this really leads to like this perfect form. So we have more children um, inside because of the school closures. We have more firearms inside homes as we just learned. The children are often less supervised because the parents are just you know, juggling so many roles at once. We have, I mean, we all are seeing in our practices um, really significantly um, increased levels of mental health problems and emotional distress in our patients. And then of course, there's a scarcity of mental health um, services because the need is just so great. Um, next slide. And so this is a really, really busy slide. Um, and so for now, just ignore these graphs, but um, the last time Dr. Novick and I, I gave this talk was back over the summer. Um, and at that time, we knew that gun sales were kind of skyrocketing and setting all of these records. Um, and we were really worried that this increase in sales would result in an increase in injuries. Um, but a, a research study that came out actually two days ago showed that there actually has been this pretty substantial increase um, in childhood gun injuries over the last year. Um, and so what these graphs show, the one on the left, um, is just children who have been injured by guns. And you can see that in 2020, this has pretty much skyrocketed. Um, and children, for the purposes of, of these numbers, are any kid less than 12 years old. Um, and then on the right side, as you can see, a smaller increase, but still a pretty big increase in kids that are either injuring themselves with a gun or injuring another child less than 12 years old with a gun. Um, so the, the increase in, in gun sales that we're seeing really does correlate with this pretty substantial increase in, in childhood gun injury. Um, and some of the factors that might be leading to this, just like Dr. Novick said, are you know, more kids being at home because schools are closed, the increased rates of um, firearm ownership, and, and there are many families who are buying guns for the first time during the pandemic. Um, and then just this kind of decreased supervision, like parents can only wear so many hats at one time, being in like a teacher, having your own job, taking care of your family, like there's only so much um, any reasonable person could be expected to do. So all those factors combined have led to, to kids being at higher risk and, and being injured by guns. Can we just oh. pause for just a, yeah. a hot second here? Cause I have got to tell you, I just want to take a pulse from everybody who's listening. Cause yeah. I know that I am just really uh, totally overwhelmed with, with everything that you're saying, given, um, and especially, particularly that COVID slide and how this is all really impacted. I mean, I, I'm just overwhelmed. Um, and I just am wondering how other people are feeling. 
Thank you, Karen. It is. I think, you know, a lot of us get really overwhelmed and we see the results of this, you know, many of us in our communities and, and Kate and I in our practices, certainly, you know, there's so much in the news um, about these this horrific events that are happening. So um, I think Kate and I both want to be sure that we let everyone know that there's that we have good news, that there really are there really are things we can do. And, and I think it can be so overwhelming to just see this happening around us and feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things we hope everyone can take away from this is that, you know, th there are things we can do. A lot of this is out of our control, but a lot of it is not. And there are steps we can take to keep the kids safer. Okay. Are you all seeing more kids um, at home unsupervised during the pandemic because they are learning virtually while their parents are still going to work? And maybe that being a factor in some of this? Yeah, I mean, sometimes the parents are going to work. And in that case, what often ends up happening that I see in my practice is you get sort of the younger adolescents are now responsible not only for their own schooling, but also for all the younger kids in the home. So you might have like a 12 or 13 year old who's, or even a 15 or 16 year old who's trying to do school, you know, while also kind of officially being responsible for the younger kids. So of course, that's just kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, but then even some of the parents who are maybe home are trying to work from home. And so, you know, they're trying to juggle watching their kids while they're also working. So it's, I think it's, it's both of those things, I would say. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions at this point? Um, yeah, I have a question. Could, could you talk a little bit more about, I think it's interesting um, that COVID, the pandemic, has seen a, a, a rise in gun sales or a rise in people getting guns. Could you just, I thought that was a really powerful point. Could you just speak to that a little more? I, yeah, I, I think, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I think um, this has been such an unsettling time for so many reasons. Um, the, the, you know, scared for your health, scared for your loved one's health has been, one big piece of it, but I think people are very worried about their jobs. People are very worried about their safety, both from the vaccine and from other sources. Um, and so what we've seen in the past is when, when fear becomes a part of what is in the news every day or what people are experiencing, that that tends to correlate with, with more people seeking security in the form of gun ownership. Um, and I, I can't speak for anyone else is experienced during this pandemic, but I, I've been very scared during this time. Um, and, and I can imagine that that some people would look to, to guns to ease some of their, their fears. And then, you know, we have your, there's of course, like all these different reasons why people own guns, right? So there's, you know, of course there's recreational use and then there's protection like Kate is talking about. And then of course there are people who are trying to purchase guns to, you know, commit crimes as well. And it's, we, we you know, we could talk about, we, we could do like three presentations on this all at once. We, we aren't, you know, we sort of are not really discussing community violence today, just because we're sort of focusing on how to keep firearms safe. But I think in answer to your question, we also have to realize that all of the factors that we know are responsible for increases in community violence and gun violence you know, things like people being out of work and, you know, um, feeling hopeless and not having great educational opportunities, all those things, of course, are worse than the pandemic. So there's a lot of worry that that is also contributing, you know, to the sort of um, epidemic of gun violence as well. And to that, I would add just, you know, again, look at all the people that have lost their job during this pandemic, exactly. all yeah. the economic fallout, you know, people not having money and really just trying to survive Right. You know, that's one of the first things I did think think about. And yet, you know, right. In addition to crime, I mean, people are trying to protect themselves because everybody's in need and people are scared and desperate. Um, wow. Yeah, I think it's all that. I agree. Hmm. All right. Any other questions? Any oh, go ahead. Sorry. It's okay. Have you guys by any chance seen a stark rise in crimes during the I'm pandemic? I'm so sorry. I can't quite hear you. Can you speak a teeny bit louder? Have you guys by any chance seen a stark rise within the number of crimes during the pandemic involving guns? 
Yes. I mean, there's been a dramatic rise in shootings and homicides, um, certainly in Philadelphia, without a question. Mm -hmm. G, I'm wondering if you um, have any thoughts about what you guys are seeing there in Bucks County. Um, does it correlate to what we're seeing in Philadelphia or are you not sure? Sorry, Karen. I couldn't find myself on the Zoom to unmute myself. <laughs> unmute myself. I'm not sure. That's a really interesting question. I think we would <laughs> we'd have to get get uh, the data on. Um, but as but as you guys are presenting, I'm just thinking about all the kids that we come in contact with in Bucks through our programs, through our community centers, and that these kids are now home and the parents are maybe overwhelmed, like you guys have been describing. So so the things that you're pointing out really does apply to us here in Bucks and certainly to the families that we work with. And I'll just add to that. Um, he and I were on a call this afternoon with our district attorney, Matt Weintraub and uh, Penny Ettinger, who is the um, executive director of our local victim service agency. Um, and they saw actually the promotion for, for this workshop tonight and reached out um, to let us know what they're doing um, here in Bucks County. And one of the things, um, one of their initiatives that they're working on is providing um, gun locks to those who um, have children in the home, those who apply for gun permits and all of those things. And he actually offered us um, an unlimited amount of gun locks um, that we can distribute to our families um, through the YWCA. So, um, you know, we're certainly going to take advantage of that opportunity and connect with them and, and, and get these safety precautions in the hands of families who need them. I'm thrilled to hear that um, Kate and I um, are have spearheaded similar programming at CHOP, both in our ER and in our primary care centers. So I'm thrilled to hear that that's happening at the um, local level for you guys as well. And I'm so excited to hear that people's response to all of this, or some people's response to all of this fear and uncertainty is a safety focused kind mm -hmm. of approach and that, you know, finding ways to, to keep kids safe while also acknowledging the increase in sales that we're seeing, which is something that's very important, um, just kind of for all kids to be safe. Mm -hmm. So let's move along. I think we'll we'll touch on some of these issues about storage and cable locks and hope to get a lot, you know, hear a lot more of your questions as we move forward. Sounds great. So as pediatricians, um, our kind of guiding agency is the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and the stance of the academy is that children are safest in a home that does not have a firearm. Um, but just like we've been talking about, um, we understand that families choose to have firearms for a variety of reasons. Um, and for families that have firearms in their homes, our top priority is just keeping those kids safe. And so for the rest of our kind of time with, with everybody, um, we just wanted to talk about some strategies that can help keep kids safe in a home where a firearm is present. Um, and so we'll be talking about safe storage, um, which is what you were alluding to with the, with the ready access to having a, a cable lock. Um, we'll also be talking about the ASK program, which is a campaign that encourages parents to investigate a little further about if there are guns anywhere where their kids are spending time. And then lastly, we'll talk about um, ways to ensure kids are safe um, when they're either around um, recreational firearm use or hunting um, with family or things like that. So safe storage, um, which, you know, we, we already kind of brought up, which is awesome, um, is the number one way um, to keep kids safe from firearms. Um, and so it's been shown time and time again through so many research studies to substantially decrease the risk of death and injury at from a firearm. Um, and safe storage is a lot more than just hiding a gun uh, in a closet, under a mattress, in a, um, in a drawer. Um, it refers to kind of a, a stepwise series of safeguards that prevent the firearm from being used in any unauthorized way. Um, for our purposes, we're, we're talking about kids. 
Um, but that also includes what we were talking about with you know, crime or firearms being found or stolen. Um, and so children, which we as pediatricians love, um, and as parents, one of, one of the favorite things about kids is how curious they are. Um, and while this is such a wonderful quality, this is also unfortunately something that puts them at pretty high risk for accidentally harming themselves. Um, and so this is why we just really don't trust kids are around firearms. Um, and even families who go out of their way to talk to their kids about gun safety um, or use, there's the NRA has a program that, that teaches kids about firearm safety. A lot of the research studies, um, which are pretty powerful, show that kids who have never heard about gun safety versus kids who've been educated by their families have pretty much the same um, risk of handling a firearm inappropriately if they're left alone um, with, with a gun. Um, and kids, even when families think they don't know where the gun is, 75% of them know where the gun is kept in the house. Um, so basically um, teaching your kid not to play with a gun or, or hiding it in an unsafe location doesn't really work to keep them safe. Um, and so the thing that we, one of the things that, that we like to say is that you really can't gun proof young children, you can only child proof your gun. Um, and so that means that safe storing your gun is just the best way to prevent your child from harming themselves or somebody else. Um, the other thing that is pretty frightening is that children as young as three are strong enough to pull the trigger of a gun. Um, and we don't really trust like toddlers to not go into cabinets where there are medications or things that could be dangerous or not fall down stairs. We put up gates there. Um, and so the same rules kind of apply to a firearm. Anybody have any questions about that or thoughts? All right. That was a really powerful statement that you just made. Can you say that again um, yeah. about not um, can child proofing? You, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think that was really powerful. Um, yeah, yeah. You know what? In fact, that's something that maybe you could write into the chat. I think that is like hugely powerful for people to like walk away and remember that. I'll put it in, Kate. Go. You can. Thank you. You proceed. I'll put it in. Okay. okay. And and in just. I, it's that you can't gum proof your children. You can only child proof your gun. Um, and so that's kind of our, what we're gonna talk about for the rest of our time. Um, for teenagers, it's a little bit different. Um, they are you know, better at, sometimes by choice, better at following just um, instructions, but um, <laughs> just depression is a pretty common thing among teenagers. Um, and especially during the COVID pandemic, one thing we've seen at the hospital um, and in the primary care practices is that teenagers are really struggling with COVID um, and the rates of mental health with depression and anxiety and suicidality are all just through the roof. Um, and so even before COVID, um, one in five teenagers um, endorsed feeling some moment of depression at some point before they were 18 years old. And I'm sure that number is much, much higher now. Um, and teens that have depression are at pretty high risk um, or at high risk for suicide. The problem, especially in teenagers, is that teenagers are really impulsive. Um, and that teens, when they, when they asked teenagers how long um, it took them to decide to commit suicide and teenagers who survived suicide, most of the teenagers said it took them less than an hour to go from the choice to commit suicide to the, to the attempt at committing suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, to me, so scary because this means a lot of the warning signs of depression that we are told to kind of watch out for in our teenagers just might not be there because all it can take is a breakup, a bad test score, a fight with someone um, to, to make a teenager go to a pretty extreme um, measure. The reason that, that firearms are, are such a problem um, in teenagers with suicide um, is that the, com the, the completion of suicide is much more likely to happen if a teenager uses a gun. 
And that statistic about suicide completion with a gun being 85%. Um, versus only 4% with other methods, I think is, is pretty powerful. Um, and the way this plays out, at least in the emergency room, is if a child or a teenager decide, makes a snap decision to, for example, overdose, they may take a bunch of medication and often will immediately after call a family member, a loved one, a friend, and tell them what's happened. And that gives them the, the person they're calling the chance to call the emergency services, bring the child to the emergency room, pump their stomach, get them the medications they need. And if they use a gun, they just don't have that chance. Um, and so giving, preventing teenagers from, from having access to guns is so important because we may not have warning signs that they want to harm themselves um, and we're preventing them from having a very lethal um, means of com committing suicide. Um, the other really powerful statistic is that 80% of the guns that teenagers use to commit suicide were owned by a family member. And so there really is this, you know, horrible, horrible outcome from teenagers that that use guns to commit suicide, but there's also this opportunity to protect our teenagers and to take steps to keep those guns away. Um, what is the rate of preteens um, committing suicide or attempting suicide by gun? I don't know That's those numbers. Question. Yeah, I don't either. I'm just, I'm just sort of curious because I do know that, you know, sometimes even younger kids, mm -hmm. you know, commit suicide. And again, like you don't really see it coming. So I'm really just sort of curious. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know those numbers and I'd be curious to try to find a study about it. But in my, anecdotally, I'll say in my practice, mm -hmm. I've never seen suicidality in 10 and 11 year olds like I've seen it this year. Like, it's crazy. I mean, it used to be this rare thing. You'd have an 89 year old, you know, who might say they're thinking of suicide. It, it, I am definitely seeing younger and younger kids, but I don't know any data around that. Wow. And, and that has been my experience in the emergency room as well is I I'm doing a project in the emergency room um, where I look at all of the patients that come in with suicidal ideation or, or action. Mm -hmm. And I, started this project before the pandemic and the, the age, I would say the frequency of teenagers mm -hmm. and preteens is just, I wish I had a number to describe how mm -hmm. high it is. Mm -hmm. um, but the age just as, as Dorothy was saying has, has really dropped and it's heartbreaking to see an eight year old. Um, or I, I think they're the youngest I've seen is seven who oh. has gone to, to lengths to, to end their life. Oh my. Yeah. Can I ask a question around that? Um, those two groups that you guys were just talking about are, are the groups of kids that we work with here at the Y. We have teens, uh, we have the preteens, of course. Um, have, are you seeing anything that suggests uh, having these conversations with the young people might help in terms of an intervention or just, you know, to make them think about their actions? Are you guys seeing that or have any recommendations that we could share with our young people uh, in our programs? Yeah, always helps. I mean, for sure, you know, it's um, it's the combination of the suicidality and the presence of the firearm, right? That's creating this problem. So we're gonna be talking a lot about how we can keep the firearm safe. But of course, in addition to that, you know, the more support we can give our young kids, you know, the better. And there are suicide hotlines. I, to me, I think it's just really a question of sort of bringing it out into the open and talking about it. I worry of caught about the stress of the pandemic and really this enormous stress that especially my patients who are growing up, you know, in underserved areas whose families done a lot of means to help with things like tutors and, you know, private spaces to do school and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's definitely much worse um, in lower income families, I would say. Um, but also the chance just to sort of be able to, you know, be able to talk about it, just to know that, you know, there's a safe space where you can bring that is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what makes teenagers particularly challenging um, is just their, their, their impulsiveness and their inability to mm -hmm. see 
consequences of their actions and to realize that, that the way they're feeling is temporary. Um, and a really encouraging thing I found when I was looking at some of these statistics is that the duration of time that teens feel this down to, to take extreme measures is pretty short. Um, that you know they don't hold on to these feelings for maybe as long as, as young adults and older adults do. And so if there's a way for us to bridge them in that moment of crisis, to give them the support, um, and they're so lucky to have the support of, of your organization um, to, to get them through those moments, there's, there is you know, a light at the end of the tunnel if we can get them there. What was it, Kate, I think, am I right? 90%, right, of kids who attempt suicide never go on to yep. commit suicide. Yeah, so, so that, if we can yeah. get them there, and if we can, mm -hmm. if even if, I mean, God forbid they, they do have a suicide attempt, if it's with a less lethal mean, then the opportunity to help them is, is obviously right. so much exactly. higher. Yeah, I think one of the things, and, and Ashley um, maybe would want to share, but um, one of the things we've been doing with the youth in our programs, um, with Typically, we'd have a, a pretty strong academic focus and we build in some social and emotional competencies. But since mm -hmm. COVID has started, we've really seen the need uh, for the kids to have that connection with one another, to have an opportunity to express themselves. So our program has, has really been focusing on building the social emotional competencies, the, the coping mechanisms, the, the healthy relationships, the decision making. So that way, you know, we're building these things in kids so they have some, you know, positive um, connections and people that they can go to um, should they be having any of these, these feelings. I love that. And those things are exactly what has been shown to really make all the difference, you know, as you're trying to build resilience for kids. Mm -hmm. I continually feel like we need to give all these kids a big academic break, like cut them some slack. This so the last thing they need is more academic pressure at this moment. They just need to be able to kind of get through this and make the connections that they can. So I, I applaud you enormously for that work. I also think something that's that I've noticed just in talking to teenagers, both in the kind of inpatient and outpatient world, is that a lot of the sources that they draw strength and pride and self worth from, whether it's sports or art or dance or social interactions, a lot of those things have been removed. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and being able to provide an alternative means for them to validate themselves and to feel like they're contributing in some way. I, I've found has been pretty, pretty helpful. Um, and also does not place an additional stress around like the relationship with their parent or something. Cause it's so, it's so positively focused. Yeah. All right, moving forward. So we're gonna move forward into what do we mean by safe storage? And this is kind of like the nitty gritty, you know of, um, of this conversation. We definitely know, as Kate has said, that safe storage does work to keep kids safer. So that's kind of, you know, the good news we have to share with you all. Safe storage by definition um, means keeping your firearm locked, unloaded, and separate from the ammunition. And it's really important that families understand that all three of those things need to be true for the firearm to be as safe as possible. Go ahead, Kate. Next slide. So these are um, the storage devices that you'll hear about that are out there. And I think it's really helpful just to kind of go through them and educate ourselves as much as possible, sort of, you know, what works and what doesn't. So the first one is a trigger lock. And we see we put a big X through the trigger lock because the trigger lock is actually uh, no longer recommended. Trigger lock is great because it's very small and inexpensive. And what it does is it actually locks into the actual like hole there. You can see where the trigger is. And the idea is that then you can't pull the trigger. The problem is that um, number one, the firearm can be loaded. So, um, you know, you can lock up the trigger, but the weapon is still loaded. And what can happen is that as you're taking the lock on or off, you can accidentally discharge the firearm. The other thing um, that I've, seen in some studies is that the the rod that actually locks the lock can get perilously close to the trigger and discharge it by accident even just in the course of handling a, a firearm with that lock on it 
And then as far as what we were talking about um, with um, guns being lost and stolen, you know, anybody with a drill can just kind of like steal that firearm and, you know, take that thing off. So that's why trigger locks are out there. They're very inexpensive, but um, are, are no longer currently recommended. A cable lock is a great option. And that's what I think Kristen was talking about uh, distributing. And this is what we're distributing as well at CHOP. So cable locks were also very inexpensive. They run from about um, two or three wholesale to about seven or $10. You can get them on Amazon or at you know um, Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, many uh, police departments do give them out for free. We actually got a whole bunch for free to give um, as well to our patients from the Philadelphia Police Department and then they ran completely out. So I'm thrilled to hear that it sounds like you have such a great supply coming your way. Um, cable locks, as I said, they're inexpensive. They're also pretty small. They're about 15 inches long. And what they are is it's a cable that locks into that little red square at the base of it. And the nice thing about them is that the cable threads through the space in the firearm where the ammunition lives. So you have to take that ammunition out in order to put the cable in. So in order to use a cable lock, your weapon must be unloaded. So that's another really great thing about a cable lock. A safe is kind of considered the most secure. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, safes are much more expensive. They run 25 or 50 or even I think sometimes more um, than that, depending on how you know, large and what kind of features they have. Um, but safes are very secure. One thing to know about safes, of course, is that the weapon can be loaded when you put it into the safe. So again, important just to remind people who are using a safe that you need to take the ammunition out and lock it elsewhere before you put the firearm in the safe. And then very, very important with cable locks and with safes um, to be sure that the keys to all of those things are just, you know, hidden in a place where nobody knows where they are. I think we have someone with their hand raised for it with a question. Zoom user. Yes, I wanted to make a comment. Um, most of the uh, police departments, I know our police department in Ben Salem, they give away them $700 cable locks. They actually give them to you. Um, you should check into that first. Thank you buying. so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's And the more we can sort of crowdsource, the better. Many local police departments do give them away. So that's really helpful information. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Um, we do have, and we're, are we going to, can you show it, Kate? I sure can. Oh, I don't perfect. know if you're going to be able to hear you all it, a so. video about how to use the cable lock that I'm describing. I have found this really useful as I'm talking to families about locking up their weapons. Are you fast forwarding or are we supposed to be able to hear him? Can you guys not, can you not hear him? Mm -mm. No, we can't hear. Interesting. That might be a problem. Hold on one second. We can talk <laughs> while he shows. Hi, I'm Jewel Williams, Sheriff of Philadelphia. Together we can make our city a safer place to live by securing your guns. If you have a gun, get a lock. This is a semi-automatic weapon. As soon as you get home, you take the clip out. You want to rack it to make sure there's no bullets inside the gun. To ensure the safety of any weapon or any gun, Take your gun lock, slide it through the slide uh, handle of the gun. Then want to twist the key, lock the gun, separate the key from the gun. One of the best ways to make your gun safe is putting it in a lock box. Lock it up. Separate the key. Now you have a safe semi-automatic pistol. This is a revolver. To make it safe, you take the gun lock, put it through the barrel, 
insert it into the pad of the lock and turn the key and then separate the key from the gun. In order to make sure the gun is safe, you want to put it inside a lock box. Separate the key. This is a 12 gauge pump shotgun. In order to make it safe by putting a gun lock on it, you must put it through the feeding chamber. So you feed it through, insert it into the pad of the lock, and it's safe. It's very important that you secure any weapon that you have in your home. Let's make our children safe. And if you need a gun lock, it's free at the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office on the fifth floor, 100 South Broad Street. Got a gun? Get a lock. So I just put a link to that video for anyone who wants the pleasure of watching it again or looking at it closer. There's a link to that video um, in the chat. So we're going to move on a little bit from safe storage um, and talk about the ask campaign. Are there any other safe storage issues or questions people would like to ask about before we move forward? Okay, so the ASK campaign um, stands for Asking Saves Kids. And the idea here, this is another thing that we can do to um, keep kids um, from getting hold of firearms. The idea is that, you know, keeping firearms locked, loaded, um, unloaded, and separate from the ignition at home is, as we've said, incredibly important. The problem is that kids then can go to other people's homes. And I've heard this um, happen in my own practice in my own life, actually, where, you know, a, a child goes to like a relative's house or for a play date or, you know, a babysitter's house or something like that. And there's a firearm kept there. So the idea behind the ask campaign is to encourage families to ask other adults whose home the child is going to, whether there might be a firearm present in their house. And uh, next slide. So this, I think, you know, feels like kind of a daunting thing for a lot of people to figure out how to ask this question. So the Brady website and the American Academy of Theatrics website has some excellent sort of language that um, people can use and um, that we encourage our families to use. What I'd like to do is, first of all, kind of think about blaming it on um, your child. Like nobody wants to feel that the, the friend whose child, whose home your child is going to, you don't want to feel like you're accusing them or being intrusive there. So instead of sort of saying like, do you have a gun, which might make the person feel offended, you can kind of blame it on the kid. Like my kid is so curious. He gets into everything. I can't keep him out of the cupboards. You know, let me just be sure. Is there a gun or anything else that might be dangerous in your home? The other idea is to blame me. My pediatrician told me to check and be sure that there are no guns anywhere my child plays. You know, she told me to ask you, do you have any firearms in your home? Another thing I like to do is encourage families to wrap it into the same kinds of questions we ask about general safety whenever our kids go somewhere else. So you might say, you know, oh, I know some kids, you know, sit in the front seat, but you know, we, my kid isn't big enough. We really like him still in the back seat of the car in case you go anywhere. Oh, and also do you have any firearms in your home? you know, wrap it into the conversation about like my child has a peanut allergy or he's not allowed to watch PG-13 movies or any of the kind of rules that you might give to the babysitter or the relative whose house your child is going to. And the last thing I really like to do, and I do this in my own practice when I'm asking families about firearms, I like to introduce it as a question like, is it okay if I ask? Or do you mind my asking? You know, or I'm sorry to ask. Because that right there sort of says that you're not trying to be intrusive and you're not trying to be difficult. You know, you're asking permission to have this conversation. So those are some of the um, ways that we can start to be sure that kids are safe other places where they go as well.
can I ask a quick question? Please, yeah. So if you have a, um, if you have this conversation with a parent and they say, yes, you, they do have um, a gun in the home, what would be, like, what are your recommendations of next steps? Is it not having your kid go there or? Yeah, yeah it's an excellent question. Thank you. I think the first next step is, oh, well, can I ask how you, how you store the firearm? Because if it turns out that that firearm is, you know, locked, loaded, except for the ammunition in a safe where nobody knows where the keys are, you know, I would feel more comfortable um, with my child going there. Of course, that's an individual decision. You might just say, you know what? No, I'm not going to send my child to a babysitter who has a firearm no matter what. But um, another option is to be sure that it's stored safely. I think you can also Thank you. kind of, so what you were saying, Dorothy, is say, if, if the parent says, yeah, we have, a, we have a gun at home, but my kids know not to touch it. And you can say, well, you know, I, I, I have not taught my children those same lessons. Like, would, would you be able to store it differently while my kid is there just because, you know, our children have different expectations. Even though we've talked about how um, that may not be the most effective strategy at protecting children since it doesn't seem like talking to them actually leads to them um, behaving differently about, about guns, um, that could be another way to, again, blame it on your child without actually blaming it on your child. This is such an important topic um, and not at all easy to do. Um, even though I like the quotes that you offered, I think that this is really very helpful. But I guess there's a part of me that thinks because there are so many people in society that do have guns for whatever the reasons, and, and we do know that. Um, and, and it does feel like to me there's so much um, fear, I guess, that people have around that. So even if you ask in a nice way, a parent could just lie to you and say, no, they don't have a gun, but really they do have a gun. So I just still just think about how do you really know that you're even getting the right answers here? Um, and so as a parent, what is the right thing? Is the right thing to just keep your child home and just not have your child go to other places, you know, unless it's with relatives where you know for sure that your child is going to be safe. And I don't think that that's the world that we really want to live in, but I guess I, I just want to put that out there. Yeah, thank you, Karen. I guess I have two sort of thoughts on that. One is another thing that I didn't include in the slides, but it's something I also say at work when I'm talking to families about this is to also preface it by being sure that the person knows you're asking just purely in terms of safety. So I hope you don't mind my asking. I'm only asking so I can just be sure that my child stays as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and I understand this can be a sensitive conversation. It only it can stay between you and me you know, is there ever a fireman inside your house? So preface it by being sure people don't think that you're asking so that you can like report them to DHS or to law enforcement or, you know, to ICE or anybody else, you know, they might be scared of. And so, yeah, it is, it's a very, it feels like a close kept secret for a lot of people. Yeah. So of course people can always be dishonest, but I think if you, if you frame it really in terms of safety and you say that right up front, and anticipate some of those worries that people have about disclosing it. Hopefully that would help a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, I think you're right. You know, it kind of becomes a risk benefit. Do we lock our children in a bubble and never let them leave the house? Or do we do our best to, you know, mitigate the risks that are out there in the world as much as possible? And that that's a tricky one. I think every parent has to answer for themselves. It's kind Thank of like you. when you send a kid, you know, to someone's house and before, and the kid comes home and tells you that they, weren't in a car seat or didn't use a seatbelt. And you just feel like so personally wounded, like how could someone have put my child, but it happens, you right. know, so you do your very best to prevent it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those additional thoughts. Thank you, very helpful. It looks uh, like we also have a, a question from the yeah. Zoom user. Zoom user. Go ahead. Would you like to unmute yourself to the Zoom users so we can hear your question? You want to speak to Faith? This is Faith, the Zoom user. Can you hear me? Faith, yes. Yes. Thank can you, you hear me? Yes, well, we can. This is my opinion. I have done it <clears throat> and it's work. I raised six children and I'm help raising a, a grandchild. Just like you teach a child to don't touch the oven, 
the gas or the electric part on there, it, it could burn you to death or the oven. It could cause gas and cause you to get real sick and, and, and you end up in a hospital. And the same thing um, about closing their hand in the refrigerator. So that's how they want to be so curious. Okay. And they will keep searching till they find that gun. Uh, I'll show it to them and then I won't show them how I locked it up and everything, but I would tell them what that gun costs. I tell them right straight out. I don't pull, I don't sugarcoat anything. Because this you. is their this is their life. Yeah. Thank you, Faith. And it sounds like, I mean, I commend you for having this conversation, you know, with your kids and your grandkid and being sure that you're teaching them that kind of respect for the firearm, because that is an incredibly important part of this conversation. That's right. One place where um, we worry that with firearms, it's a little bit different from things like playing with the stove or, you know, getting your hand stuck in a door is that there's also for a lot of kids sort of this like allure of a firearm, you know, like it's fun, like there's toy guns and they see guns on TV and, you know, there's kind of like, there's a, there's a pull towards a firearm that I think is not there quite as much with something like fire or, you know, the oven, which is a thing grownups, you know, cook with. Right. And so that's why, you know, it's, a, I, I a hundred percent agree with you. We need to teach the kids the respect but we don't want to trust that respect enough because we know that kids can be so curious and because we know that firearms do carry this allure and that, you know, it's, you know, they can't tell the difference. Many times we've, you know, lots of people have looked at this and asked kids to tell the difference between a toy gun and a real gun or a loaded gun and an unloaded gun, like kids don't know the difference. So I think it's, it's all important to teach the kids that and to do the good job you're doing of keeping that firearm where the kids cannot get it. And as you were talking about the examples, you know, the thing that crossed my mind was that I think a responsible gun owner would be as transparent as possible with another parent who was asking the question. And if they're, if you're getting a response um, that doesn't seem so honest and transparent. I think maybe that's a red flag to a parent mm -hmm. saying, you know, not this house. Mm -hmm. And I think what's tricky is sometimes you don't have a choice. You know, sometimes it's your uncle who's going to watch the kids while you work. You know, if it's sort of an optional kind of like, can my child go play there? It's a little easier, you know, when it's, you know, a relative or a friend, you know, who you really is, who you, who you. Go to your house. But I love, you know, thank you again, Faith, for letting us know, you know, if you know someone where your child is going and they don't have their firearm locked, like go get that free cable lock, just bring it over. You know, thanks so much for letting me know. Here's a cable lock. Here's a video, you know. And, uh, you know, you can also help out in that way. Yeah. G has put a question in the chat for everybody. Um, have you seen an increase or a decrease in toy guns? And if that impacts kids' interest in guns? Um, and what about video games? I. I haven't seen any numbers specifically about toy gun sales or things like that. Um, I did see this really, really striking video that I wanted to show to everybody today because it's kind of the reason that I got so scared about guns and feel so strongly about protecting kids from them. Um, and in this video, they put real guns and, and toy guns in a room and put kind of hidden cameras and have parents stand behind like a one-way glass. Um, and basically all these parents watched while their kids found both things and even the children who'd been told like never touch a gun, grab an adult immediately, all of those things, um, picked it up and pretty much immediately pointed it at themselves or another child. Um, 
And so while I don't know specifically about the numbers of toy guns, I do know that kids really can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Um, and I, as for, as for video games, I know that there's been kind of a lot of interest about if violent video games increase your fascination with, with weapons or increase any violent behavior you might have. Um, Dorothy, I don't know if you know what the, what the research has showed about that. I don't, I don't know the research. I think that it, it kind of becomes like a, like a chicken and egg problem because the same people who might be so excited by playing a really violent video game, you know, might have a tendency towards having those more aggressive instincts in the first place. So it's really hard to prove, you know, what came first, the kids interest in, you know, guns for starters or the video game that gave them that interest. I also think there's a little bit of danger in, in people who feel like they have firearm familiarity from playing video games because mm -hmm. the skills to play a video game are very different from the skills to safely use a firearm. Um, and so I think there may be some kind of false confidence in in playing a lot of games that use those things and then real life going and, and using one and, and not maybe being as careful with it as you otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. For our last couple minutes, um, I just wanted to talk super quickly about um, families that use firearms for recreational reasons. Um, and so I think kind of the, the three general main ideas are to make sure that the gun is always pointed in a safe direction, um, always keeping the finger off the trigger until the gun is, until you're absolutely sure you want to shoot, and then keeping the gun unloaded until um, you're ready to use it. And there are some great recommendations from the Pennsylvania Game Commission um, that talk all about um, very specific things to do, specifically while hunting, but these rules also apply um, to any, any recreational gun use, which are to keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. So making sure that you only point it um, at something you are intending to shoot, um, making sure that the target that you're identifying is what you really want to um, be targeting. Always checking is knowing what's beyond your target, which I think is, is really important for things like shooting ranges or um, for, for hunting in general. Um, and then this is kind of what Faith was talking about, which is respect for firearms. So treating all firearms like they're loaded at all times and then removing ammunition when the firearm's not in use. And then lastly um, is just trigger caution. So, so not touching the trigger until you're absolutely ready to shoot and then never having a loaded firearm in a situation where you are running, jumping, climbing, distracted, um, any situation where you are not completely focused on the activity you're doing. And so our, our main takeaway points today um, with what we were talking about with the increase in firearm sales and, and gun injuries in children, um, just, just breaking records in the United States in the last year. Um, that, that practicing firearm safety right now is, is just so unbelievably important. It's always important, but we are at kind of a critical moment right now. Um, and we hope that, that these strategies we've talked about are, are helpful to keep you and your kids safe um, if, you're, if you have a firearm at home or if you know, your child is spending time in, in other people's homes. Um, and so kind of the main things we talked about today are that gun sales are at an all-time high. Um, we talked about how educating children about hide or, or hiding guns is just really not enough, that we really need to practice these safe storage strategies, which means that the gun is locked, unloaded, and separated from ammunition. Um, we talked about asking about firearms in other homes or places where your child might spend time. And then we, for firearm use recreationally, we talked about the smart tips, um, which, which can help to you know, still be able to use the firearm, but use it in a way that makes it as safe as possible. Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, quickly highlight uh, in the chat, we have a thank you uh, from Roweda. I apologize if I uh, pronounce your name wrong, but just uh, this is a really helpful topic. And she would like to join her voice with Mr. G and bring this helpful information to uh, teen groups and especially, especially teen groups and other groups um, for youth at YWCA. So thank you.
That's wonderful. We're so glad that that everybody just seems so both willing to support teenagers and, and you have so much practical knowledge of ways to do it with the free gun locks and having all these supports for for these for these teens, which is great. I know a lot of the patients um, down here in Philly would be really grateful to have those resources too. Yeah, I, I completely second that. I think organizations like the, you know, YWCA are, you know, are really the lifesavers um, in this time when kids are so isolated. So thank you guys so much for the work that you're doing. And Kate and I are always available if anyone has any follow-up questions or feedback. It's it's really, it's just always so great to hear, you know, people's thoughts around this topic. So we're always open for that. Dorothy and Kate, I just want to again just, you know, um, echo how important this topic was and how timely. And thank you so much for, for sharing your time with us this evening. I think it was really a uh, meaningful time spent. Um, previous presenters have all always shared their slides um, after the fact. And I'm just wondering if you guys would be willing to share your slides with the Y. They have recorded this. So clearly, I mean, this is very important to them um, and push moving this along. So I hope that you guys wouldn't mind sharing. And I am just gonna throw out there, again, it's such an important topic. I hope that you guys might be willing to come back some other time, you know, and present again. Maybe it'll be a different, hopefully it'll be a different audience. But again, it's just a topic that we, we just can not, not talk about. Absolutely. I mean, this for the, the, for, for the two of us, this is really like our, this is our passion. So yeah. we wanna get the word out to as many people as we can. We'd be happy to come back. Thank you so very much. And I just want to um, say before we end as well that um, our next um, workshop will be held on uh, May 20th and the topic on that evening will be um, mindfulness. So we hope that you guys will all come back and join us as we talk about ways to again take care of ourselves, um, particularly at this very stressful time um, as this pandemic continues. Um, and please also feel free to let us know what other topics you are interested in hearing about so that we can um, put those together for you um, in, in the months to follow. So please let um, Ashley know. Um, and if you haven't registered for this session through Ashley, please do that. And again, um, we welcome hearing what future topics you're interested in hearing about. So with that, I just wanna thank my colleagues and thank you all for joining us tonight. This was really a great session. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Karen, um, yes. thank you. So if you have not emailed me already about you wanting to attend, please email me if you want to be part of the raffle. I have a $20 gift card raffle for participants. So please let me know you attend it. And so I can put you in the raffle and I will notify you next week. Thank you. Can I just mention something before folks go? Kristen, when we talked with uh, Matt and Penny today, they were talking about these, these, these incredible initiatives that they're doing in the community. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt and Penny were saying that the local police stations would be able to be a place where folks can grab those safety locks. Am I remembering that correctly, that, that they shared that with us? Yes, most uh, police departments in Bucks County do have uh, safety locks that they can distribute to residents. Uh, and maybe at the sheriff's office, but I think that's for when you're applying for permits. But we're also going to get a, a stockpile of them that we can distribute in family centers um, in case people don't have access to transportation to get to those other locations. Yeah. And, and I'll be signing up for the next presentation on gun safety. If, if these folks are back here, I will be <laughs> signing up. Thank you. <laughs> you guys brought a lot of really thoughtful questions and discussion, which totally makes the whole whole experience. So it it's yeah. been such a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have All a right. great night. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay.